When I was introduced, it was mentioned that I did come from a family that was full of a bunch of aviators. My grandfather was one of the first pilots in the Royal Air Force. He signed up in 1918. And after the war, there was, there was no work in Scotland, so he came to America. And he was a barnstormer, and he started flying out of a cinder patch in East Boston, which is now Logan International Airport. Some guys in southern New Hampshire thought this flying thing might be a good idea, and they cleared a place out of the, out of the woods and found a guy out of Boston who'd come up and set up a fixed-based operator, and that is now Manchester, Boston Regional Airport. And my grandfather was the first one to land on that field. He then opened other airports around New England, and when Britain went to war in 1939 against Germany, he went up to Canada because he figured the Brits had taught him how to fly and maybe he could volunteer up there to be part of the Canadian Air Force if the Americans weren't going to get into this thing for a while. But they apparently had already had their fill of rowdy Americans who had come up to Canada and they weren't looking for any more. <laughs> so he joined a group of volunteers that at the time was called the Auxiliary Air Force and eventually became the Civil Air Patrol. He towed targets and chased submarines off the coast and he ferried parts around New England and eventually, after the war, became the wing commander for the New Hampshire Civil Air Patrol. In New Hampshire, there is a mountain made famous by a lot of poets and writers, including Emerson, and Thoreau. It's called Mount Monadnock. And in the Indian language, Monadnock means mountain that stands alone. It does stand alone, that mountain, a couple of thousand feet above the surrounding hills. And I grew up in that region, the Monadnock region, spending many Saturdays in the hangar at Delant Hopkins Airport, or maybe at Harry, Harvey Sawyer's place out in Jaffrey at his airport, which was a little closer to Medandock. The Rose said, it's not what you look at that matters. It's what you see. <laughs> I saw joy and friendship in that hangar. And I saw opportunity in the prospect of a full-ride scholarship to go to college at the United States Air Force Academy. All of you here are responsible for what the next generation sees. You know, last year at Oshkosh, I got to go to Oshkosh. There are some really great things about being Secretary of the Air Force, and that was definitely one of them. And when I was there, I met a Civil Air Patrol cadet. Her name was Cadet Hamilton, and she was very nervous. She was brand new to the Civil Air Patrol, and I think, actually, this was her first week as a cadet, and she was away from home, and then somebody wanted to introduce her to the Secretary of the Air Force, and it was a little bit overwhelming, I think. The young people you work with are learning skills, but they are also way out of their comfort zones, in a safe place. But it's when you're out of your comfort zone growing up that you're learning what it means to be a responsible member of the community. It causes young people to grow into better versions of themselves. Now, I also visited as the secretary of the Civil Air Patrol headquarters down at Maxwell Air Force Base and saw some of your examples of what you're doing in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics kits to help teachers to demonstrate the basic scientific principles of flight and to inspire the next generation of young engineers and scientists and aviators. In our schools, and even in our engineering universities, I think many of us have lost the connection between head work and hand work to our detriment, I think. And I have met cadets of all ages at Maxwell. 
They were excelling in their cadet duties, and they were also excelling in school. One young woman that I met there was studying aeronautical engineering at Auburn University. Civil Air Patrol cadets go on to all kinds of things. The Air Force Thunderbirds fighter demonstration team currently has two former Civil Air Patrol members, Thunderbird 1 and Thunderbird 3. I was just giving our, uh, one of your commanders here a real hard time for leaving the air show behind up in Michigan to be here tonight. You obviously have your priorities wrong, sir. <laughs> You know, Thunderbird 1 and Thunderbird 3 fly in F-16s in Michigan today as former Civil Air Patrol cadets. Now, that's not too shabby for kids who grew up flying Cessnas. I don't think President Roosevelt foresaw today's Civil Air Patrol when he established the Office of Civil Defense in 1941 was len, then led by a guy named Fiorello LaGuardia, who is the mayor of New York City. At that time, even though we weren't yet in the war, FDR recognized the German threat. And he was prophetic when it came to air power. He had reports from Charles Lindbergh in 1938 that it alarmed him. Lindbergh wrote, the German air fleet is stronger than that of all other European countries together. And that same year, a man named Major General Hap Arnold was one month into his new job as the chief of the Army Air Corps when he got an urgent letter from Charles Lindbergh. It said Germany is undoubtedly the most powerful nation in the world in military aviation. And her margin of leadership is increasing with each month that passes. Lindbergh had another motive for his warnings. His objective was to keep America out of a European war, especially one in which Britain, France, and the United States were overwhelmingly outmatched. In return, the media lambasted him and called him unpatriotic. But Lindbergh was only one of two outspoken flyers at the time. The other guy was named Gil Rob Wilson. In 1935, Hermann Goering had invited both men, Lindbergh and Wilson, to tour Germany's aircraft factories and airfields. It was a deliberate power move by Germany to spread fear and to deter resistance to German expansionism. Lindbergh and Wilson traveled back and forth to Germany several times, and then they hit the speaking circuit in the United States in the 1930s. Both of them sensed that war was coming. Lindbergh sounded the alarm and called for isolation. Wilson sounded the alarm and called for action. While Lindbergh was in high school during World War I, Wilson had been a fighter pilot in France. He remembered that America had flown French planes in World War I because the US was slow to develop an aviation industry. And he also knew that Europe would drag the United States into the war just as it had done in World War I. And he said that the best thing our country could do was to prepare for war and also to prepare for German submarines along our seaboard. His words found their target. FDR became the national advocate our airmen needed. And he wisely tapped Hap Arnold to build the aerial armada required to meet that German threat. And then FDR warned the American citizenry to prepare to fight. That guy named Gil Rob Wilson had a vision for civil aviators to defend the nation's borders, while the Army and the Navy built what America would need. LaGuardia had also been a pilot in the First World War, and he knew there were some good sticks around who could help watch out for trouble. 
So they put together a plan, and LaGuardia asked Hap Arnold to review it, and Hap Arnold convened a military board to take a look at it and assigned some Air Corps officers to administer this new civilian flying service. LaGuardia signed the plan and established the predecessor to the Civil Air Patrol just six days before the attacks on Pearl Harbor. America quickly realized that the German threat was far beyond Europe. Wilson was right. It was lurking just beyond the coastline, sinking 52 oil tankers from January to March 1942. And the Civil Air Patrol responded with privately owned aircraft. And after a few months, it wasn't enough to just observe and report or report on ships in distress. In May of 1942, military leaders decided that they were going to experiment. They were going to arm the Civil Air Patrol with a 100-pound bomb, and in one case, a 325-pound bomb off of a Civil aircraft. It'd be interesting to try to try that today. <laughs> it was a pretty innovative tactic. In all, 125,000 subchaser missions found 173 German subs off the coast of the United States, attacked 57, and actually sank two. But what they did more importantly was to force the German submarines off the coast and to protect our convoys going up and down the American coast. 26 Civil Air Patrolmen were lost doing coastal patrol duty, and 90 Civil Air Patrol planes went down at sea. Years later, when a German high seas admiral was asked why the German Navy withdrew from off America's coast, he said, it was because of those damn little red and yellow airplanes. <laughs> you know, today's Civil Air Patrol missions are still important to our borders. You're flying aerial reconnaissance missions for the Drug Enforcement Administration and Border Patrol missions for the Department of Homeland Security. You're flying aggressor missions for the Super Bowl and for Red Flag and testing our District of Columbia F-16 crews on an ounce. Before 9-11, the Civil Air Patrol flew 12 air defense missions every year. Since 9-11, you have been flying 200 missions every year. Nearly every day, Air Force fighter pilots flying over our nation's capital don't know if it's a training mission until they see that red, white, and blue of a Civil Air Patrol Cessna 182. Last year, the Civil Air Patrol escorted more than 600 MQ-9 remotely piloted aircraft flights from Syracuse to Fort Drum so that the 174th Air National Guard attack wing could train. FAA rules still require escorts in most of the national airspace, at least for now. I am especially interested in eight test sites that you have for using small remotely piloted aircraft when the weather turns bad. And just last week, I was up at Grand Forks, North Dakota, where for the first time, the FAA is allowing unmanned aerial vehicles to be operated beyond line of sight in the national airspace. I think there are tremendous opportunities going forward for remotely piloted aircraft in the defense of the homeland. While remotely piloted aircraft give us options, Civil Air Patrol missions are always about people. The Civil Air Patrol flew more than 100,000 hours in each of the last two years, mostly in response to national disasters. You uploaded thousands upon thousands of images for emergency responders. 90 to 95% of the inland search and rescue 
authorized by the Air Force Rescue Coordination Center in Tyndall Air Force Base, 90 to 95% are handled by the Civil Air Patrol. And after Hurricane Katrina, the Air Force was in very high demand. At one point, there were some local leaders after that terrible disaster who were concerned about their livestock down in Louisiana, and they asked disaster headquarters in Baton Rouge for Air Force U-2 flights to get photo imagery. <laughs> the Air Force liaison officer in the headquarters there in Baton Rouge was a National Guardsman. He was a colonel mobilized for that effort, and he suggested they really didn't need enough altitude to be above surface-to-air missiles there in the bayou. And uh, that scarce asset, the U-2, at about $40,000 a flying hour, was probably a little bit more than what was required. And so he asked the Civil Air Patrol with their cameras to take care of that mission. For working so closely with the Civil Air Patrol, that guardsman actually earned a low-level ride along the flood zones to see what was really going on outside the headquarters where he had spent the last three weeks. And I know that because the guard guy who mobilized in the Baton Rouge headquarters to help out came from New Mexico, and I'm married to him. Henry David Thoreau was fond of saying, the only people who ever get any place interesting are the people who get lost. That goes double for the people who find them. The Civil Air Patrol has saved over 140 people so far in this fiscal year. That's 140 people who got to make that phone call home to say, I'm all right. Civil Air Patrol found me. They got to go home to their families. They could do that because more than 60,000 people volunteer to use their skills to serve in the communities in which you live. For a little more than $40 million a year in operations and maintenance and aircraft procurement, American civil airmen operate disaster response and search and rescue. I can appreciate the difference in operations and maintenance costs and procurement costs between a Cessna 172 and an A-10 or an F-35. <laughs> You are a civilian auxiliary. You're not a military outfit. But you are associated with us. So what do we expect of you? We expect proficiency at your skills. Flying, geolocation, emergency management, search and rescue. We expect you to be good at what you do. We expect you to be safe in your operations. Now, I don't expect you to run a military outfit, but I do expect you to be driven by the values that define the American Air Service. Integrity, service, and excellence. I also expect you to engage the next generation in a way that is positive and meaningful. Local leadership matters. It's that joy and friendship found in your hangar, like I found near Mount Monadnock. You know, modern geologists, including those at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, use the term Monadnock to describe a solitary mountain of bedrock that rises abruptly from its surroundings, revealed by the erosion of the softer rock that once surrounded it. That's how leaders are made, through the trials and erosion 
of the softer rock that reveals the granite underneath. Thank you for your service. Thank you for helping to develop the next generation of young people. Thank you for being there to save and protect our people, our borders, and the country that we love. God bless you all.